On today's Jerusalem Dateline, U.S. pushes for a ceasefire as Anthony Blinken makes his eighth trip to the region since the war began. Plus, details on the daring rescue operation, codename Arnon, which freed four hostages from captivity in Gaza. And analysis from Chuck Holton about the effect of war on the Israeli psyche. And the joyous Jewish holiday of Shavuot. All this and more coming up on this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken met Monday with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu on his eighth visit to Israel since the beginning of the war. He came to lobby for the latest U.S. ceasefire proposal. U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken met Monday with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to lobby for the latest U.S. ceasefire proposal. It's clear that virtually the entire world has come together in support of the proposal. And the only open question is, will Hamas say yes? The resolution gaining international support Monday, winning the approval of the UN Security Council. The agreement calls for a return of the hostages and an end to the war through a three-phase plan. Hamas reportedly has agreed to the proposal and begin negotiations. But its calls for an end of the fighting and an Israeli withdrawal from Gaza are non-starters for Israel. Another potential sticking point for Israel is the resolution's call for a two-state solution and, quote, unifying the Gaza Strip with the West Bank under the Palestinian Authority. We saw the October 7th uh, massacre uh, by Hamas, which was a direct result of Palestinian Authority education, not Hamas education. Itamar Marcus, founder of the Palestinian Media Watch, dismisses claims by the U.S. State Department that the PA has been revitalized and is ready for peace. The problem is that the Palestinian Authority teaches its people that Israel has no right to exist, that killing Jews is something that Allah wants, um, that destroying Israel is not only a national goal for Palestinians, but is also a goal for Islam because Israel is on holy Islamic land. These are the things that have to be changed in the Palestinian Authority. Uh, and we haven't seen any indication of any change at all in the new government. Israel is still rejoicing over the rescue of four hostages. Newly released footage shows Israeli soldiers charging into the apartment where the three male hostages were held then rushing outside under heavy gunfire. They're hurried by the soldiers to a beach and helicopters ferry them back to Israel. The hostages seem well on the outside, but the director of the medical center that received them says they've suffered physically and mentally. All of them are in severe uh, nutritional deficiency with a significantly decreased muscle mass. They have endured significant impact to their uh, physical state. Israelis are still rejoicing over the weekend rescue of those four hostages in Gaza, codenamed Arnon, for the fallen IDF soldier who assisted in the rescue. It's the first really good news from the war in a long time. The codename for the hostages themselves during the operation was Diamonds. CBN Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl has more on their return and reunion with family members. Hugs, tears, and an eager audience awaited these diamonds. Noah Argamani, Almog Meir Yan, Shlomi Ziv, and Andre Kozlov upon their arrival at Sheba Medical Center. This uh, operation required ingenuity and courage of the highest degree. And our soldiers performed in an unmatchable way. Israeli forces rescued them from two separate apartments in the Nusayret refugee camp in central Gaza. Many compared it to the 1976 rescue of 102 hostages at Entebbe airport following the hijacking of a plane by Palestinian and German terrorists. This time forces simultaneously stormed the buildings rescuing Noah from one and the three men from the other. They took them to the beach and flew out on helicopters. They are now recovering from their eight-month ordeal. They are very, very happy uh, and very communicative. They want to talk. They want to share their experience. They are very uh, excited to meet family members and friends uh, that they have not seen. Uh, but gradually and slowly, uh, the very difficult and hard stories of the time they spent in captivity start to come out. 
Israelis celebrated as news spread from the beach where lifeguards announced the operation, then spread across the country to the world. Noah Argamani is well known from the terrifying video of her capture on October 7th. Her father Yaakov thanked God and celebrated her release on his birthday. After eight months of being apart from Noah, Noah has returned, praise God. And therefore I wish to say, Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has granted us life, sustained us, and enabled us to reach this occasion. I want to thank each and every one of you, the President, the Prime Minister, everyone, each and every person. Within hours of her arrival, Noah traveled to another hospital to visit her mother, who's suffering from brain cancer. Fearing she might not see Noah again, Leora appealed to Hamas for her daughter's release. The three men were kept together in the home of a medical doctor, Ahmed al-Jamal. His son worked as a journalist, including time with Al Jazeera, a Qatari-based television station. We are exciting. We are very happy. We thank the IDF for a brilliant operation. Sadly, Al Mog Meir Yan's father died of a heart attack hours before his son arrived home. Andrei Kozlov immigrated to Israel by himself from Russia less than two years ago. His parents flew in to be with their son. Sadly, Arnon Zamora, head of the unit that led the operation, died from wounds sustained in the battle for the three men. In addition to the rescue, Arnon, a husband and father of two, had also been hailed as a hero on October 7th when he and his men saved the community of Yad Mordechai from terrorist invasion. The government renamed the rescue operation after Arnon. There are still 120 hostages, about 80 of them believed to be alive. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Jerusalem. Coming up political analysis from Alex Trayman from the Jewish News Syndicate. The rescue of four hostages might have been the big story last weekend for Israelis, but most news outlets put a bigger emphasis on Benny Gantz's resignation Sunday from Benjamin Netanyahu's war cabinet. I ask Alex Trayman from the Jewish News Syndicate about this and more. Alex Trayman, uh, you're the Jerusalem bureau chief for JNS News. Benny Gantz has just resigned from the war cabinet and the coalition. What does this mean for the government? Well, Prime Minister Netanyahu still has a uh, coalition of 64 members. This was the original coalition. Uh, Benny Gantz and his partner, Gadi Eisenkot, had joined uh, just shortly after October 7th to create a unity government for Netanyahu. Uh, Gantz was Netanyahu's primary challenger uh, in the previous election cycles, multiple election cycles, uh, and wartime. It created a, a need for unity. And now Benny Gantz and Eisenkot have decided that the time for unity is over. It's back to the time for partisan politics. Uh, it's also pretty clear that uh, Gantz has been colluding with uh, Anthony Blinken and the Biden administration. And Gantz had traveled to Washington uh, about a month ago, or two months ago, rather, uh, met with uh, Blinken, met with Kamala Harris in the White House. The trip was specifically not authorized by the prime minister. Uh, just two days after that, trip, uh, Chuck Schumer, uh, one of the ranking senators in the United States, uh, said that it was time for an Israeli election. Uh, and then, you know, Benny Gantz a week later said it was time for an Israeli election. And now Gantz pulls out of the government uh, 24 hours before Antony Blinken lands uh, in Israel on another visit. Hmm. What would new elections mean for the government and Israel in the middle of a multi-front war? Well, on the one hand, a new election would demonstrate uh, who the people of Israel give the mandate to lead Israel during this period of crisis. Uh, on the other hand, uh, in, in Israel, when once you call an election, the existing government becomes a caretaker government until the time in which a new government is formed, which could be months after uh, an election, and the election itself would be months away. So it could hamstring the government, particularly in Israel, where the court and the attorney general try to limit uh, how how much uh, the government can actually do. Would it make it more dangerous for Israel in the middle of this war? 
Oh, I think so. And, and I actually think that in many ways, uh, Gantz's uh, resignation from the government, uh, taking cues from the Biden administration and Anthony Blinken, is meant to delegitimize uh, Israel's government and the international community so that they could say that this is what they like to call a far-right extremist government, even though it's a, it's a center-right government. And also, it's probably uh, to prevent, to try to prevent Netanyahu from expanding the war uh, into southern Lebanon and to tackle Hezbollah, which has been just pummeling Israel uh, over the last eight months and even more so in the last several weeks. Uh, the Biden administration does not want Israel to go to war with Hezbollah uh, in the lead up to the U.S. elections. So can you expand on this? Uh, despite the opposition by the U.S. government and Benny Gantz, uh, even most Israelis really prefer Benjamin Netanyahu? Well, that's what the, the latest polls have indicated. And you've seen, uh, like, uh, since the beginning of the war, when Netanyahu's popularity uh, dropped down to historically low levels, he's been slowly climbing back up in the polls. Uh, when Gantz entered the unity government, people saw him as a statesman-like alternative, uh, someone who was putting the national good before his own political interest by joining his opponent to create a, a unity government. But now that Gantz is leaving the unity government, uh, it's becoming clear to many Israelis that uh, Gantz is is just an opportunist and, and is throwing this whole concept of unity out the window, even while he, he continues to, to preach for unity. Gantz and Eisenkot, who are both chiefs of staff of the military, in many ways, they represent the deep rot that's been inside the Israeli military establishment that has led to these false conceptions uh, that ultimately resulted in, in October 7th attack in this war. Mm -hmm. uh, and this actually gives Netanyahu a, a a golden opportunity to uh, to take these left wing and failed chiefs of staff out to replace them with uh, some really qualified uh, generals and former generals or other professionals that can strengthen the war cabinet and, and help guide Netanyahu uh, and the IDF to a swift and decisive victory. So are we seeing sort of a, a lot of hyperbole about what actually this means to the coalition government? Well, it's wishful thinking, I think, on the part of uh, the international press. They're hoping that this creates uh, instability within the coalition. It's not going to, to damage the stability of the coalition. What it is going to do, potentially, uh, is to harm the government's international standing, whereby, uh, whereby opponents of Netanyahu's policies will be able to turn around and say, this is not a unity government, this is a narrow right-wing government filled with what they term as, as extremists. Uh, and and then it will also uh, give tailwind to the protest movement in Israel, which caused uh, tremendous havoc uh, mm -hmm. in Israel this past summer, just months before October 7th, over Netanyahu and his coalition's proposed judicial reforms. Would you say most Israelis prefer not to go to elections and they want to stand at least for the, for the uh, duration of the war behind Netanyahu and the way he's handling the war? I'm not certain that uh, all Net all Israelis specifically want to stand behind Netanyahu as opposed to anybody else, but Netanyahu is the prime minister, and uh, Israelis are fighting uh, in Gaza, left and right, alongside each other, supporters of the prime minister, opponents of the prime minister, and they would have hoped that in this uh, time of uh, intense security crisis that the politicians would do the same. What do most Israelis feel about a two-state solution? Uh, this is the clearest question of all. Israelis are uh, adamantly opposed to the creation of a Palestinian state at this time. The idea that a Palestinian state could be the uh, the result of uh, the worst, most heinous, barbaric attack in the history of the modern Jewish state, uh, this pogrom which took place on October 7th, the murder of 1,200 people, the kidnapping of over 250, that that action could then lead directly to the creation of a Palestinian state is a Warrant. Well, Alex Trayman, uh, Jerusalem Bureau Chief of JNS News, uh, uh, org. That's where people can, uh, can find all of your reporting. Thanks for joining us. Still ahead, the toll of war. Eight months in, has it become Israel's new normal? All eyes are on Israel's north these days as Hezbollah attacks from Lebanon continue and appear to be escalating. I spoke with Chuck Holton about this and how Israelis are holding up eight months into the war. Take a look. 
Chuck Holton, great to have you back here in, uh, in the land. Tell us, uh, it's been eight months since October 7th. Where do you see the war after this time? Uh, well, you mean where it is right now, yeah. what, what, sure. what we're looking at? You know, when I first came here on the 9th of October, two days after the attack, everything was in chaos. Everything was closed down. People were very worried. They were very scared. I got guns pulled on me everywhere I went because they were so worried about terrorists running sure. around. And what we've seen is that it's gone from being, because that, that was a very, very out of the ordinary event. Um, but now it's become ordinary. And so what we've seen is that this war, even within Israel, people that live here, they've gotten inured to it. They've gotten used to it. And so um, they're still very concerned, obviously, especially more so mm -hmm. here, but in the United States, uh, it, it's hard because the news exists to report the out of the ordinary. It's hard sometimes for people in the States to continue to care because now what was out of the ordinary has become ordinary here. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, more rockets from the north. Oh, more fighting in the south. Uh, and yet the people here in Israel are still hurting. There's still 100,000 people that are stuck in hotels. Imagine living in a hotel for eight months with your kids in one mm -hmm. room. I mean, this is what they're having to deal with and not being able to go to your job, not being able to go to your school. Imagine getting to the point where the air raid sirens are just normal for you. I just came from Jish in the north. It's just outside of the evacuation zone. So people are living there and they're under attack by Hezbollah every single day to the point where their kids are still just playing in the streets and they, they hear that siren go off and they just, eh, you know, mm -hmm. it's become normal. Yeah. And I think there's real danger in that because you get this normalcy bias that will if things escalate quickly, especially in the north, uh, we'll get a lot of people killed and um, again, cause Americans to sort of stop praying for and supporting Israel. So I think we need to be diligent to continue to think of our brothers and sisters here mm -hmm. and to continue to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And um, that's what we're trying to do is continue to get that word out. Yeah, yeah. You were just up in the north and it's, it seems to escalate. Uh, there were a lot of fires uh, this week. And uh, how would you describe the situation and how much more serious is that than Hamas down in the Gaza Strip. The number of rockets coming across from Lebanon is at an all-time high now. Uh, it's higher than it was at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about month over month from April to May, they saw a 50% increase in the number of drone attacks, a lot more drones coming across. And that, that says to me that Hezbollah is being supplied with those drones. They're not, because it's newer technology, it's not likely that they had those drones in storage for the last 10 years and they're just pulling them out like the rockets and shooting mm -hmm. them. They're getting those drones from Iran right now. And that means that there's, there's a pipeline coming from Iran. That's a big problem that Israel is trying to address right. and needs to address in Syria because that's that land bridge, right? right? Um, the, the forest fires and stuff that are starting, the, the Iron Dome system is not, it doesn't shoot down a, uh, a missile or a drone or anything unless it's heading for a populated area. But the problem is if it lands in an open field, then it catches that field on fire and we're seeing massive fires up there. Mm -hmm. Suffice it to say that if Gaza was not the focus of everything right now, everybody would be so concerned about what's going on in the north right. that that would be its own war. And the people up there are very concerned that they're going to have to deal with this at some point by a ground invasion. Uh, personally, it, it just from what I've seen in the last week up there, I don't believe that a ground invasion is imminent, in, in, meaning in days or even mm -hmm. weeks, uh, but uh, it could change at any time. Right. And uh, like I say, at some point, Israel is going to have to deal with that. If they can't do it diplomatically, they're gonna have to do it militarily. Yeah, yeah. So we have the North, we have, uh, Israel right now on the southern border in Rafah, right now on the Egyptian-Israeli border. Uh, how can people be informed and also how can people be praying right now? Well, we obviously need to pray that, uh, my, my prayer is always that God would thwart the plans of evil men. Uh, we don't know who's, you know, God, God knows the heart. And so if, if we pray that God will thwart the plans of evil men, I think that pretty much covers it. Uh, but specifically for the, the troops that are in Rafa, they say that the, some of the fighting that's happening in northern Gaza right now is the most intense fighting that they have ever seen in this war. And uh, we don't hear a lot about 
about that in the news. So we need to be praying for those troops that are still there. There are a lot fewer troops that are doing the fighting mm -hmm. now, and that's a big problem. Yeah. Chuck Holton, great to be with you. We'll be praying. And, and how do we uh, find you on uh, YouTube? The Hot Zone with Chuck Holton, or just go to CBN's YouTube channel, and I'll be there almost every night. All right, Chuck, see you there. All right, take care. Up next, celebrating Shavuot, the giving of the Ten Commandments to the Jewish people at Mount Sinai. Thank you for watching Jerusalem Dayline. We're committed to providing you with unbiased reporting from the Holy Land. Through weekly broadcasts, podcasts, and online media, our vision is to reach millions around the globe with the true story of what's happening in Israel and the Middle East, all from a biblical and prophetic perspective. This is a big vision and is only made possible by the generous support of people like you. Call us toll free at 1-800-700-7000 or go to cbn.com slash Jerusalem Dateline and make a donation that will help spread the light of truth about Israel throughout the world. This week the Jewish community celebrates Shavuot when God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses on Mount Sinai. It's also Pentecost for Christians, the day of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. First Fruits of Zion founder Boaz Michael explains the connection between the two. Shavuot is uh, Pentecost, but in Hebrew it's Shavuot. And it's um, the time of traditionally of God giving the people of Israel, the Jewish people, the Torah at Mount Sinai. There's so many beautiful parallels um, that take place with Shavuot. Um, imagine Mount Sinai with the mountains above it, the covenant given to the people of Israel. This reminds us of a hoopah over a bride and a groom. It tells us that God is making a covenant with his bride Israel. There's a marriage that takes place. So Shavuot is a celebration of the giving of the commandments, but more than that, we've been redeemed from Egypt, we've wandered through the wilderness, we've come to Mount Sinai, and we enter into an intimate relationship with Hashem, with God, through the giving of His commandments and the covenant that He gives to us, the Torah at Mount Sinai. And the Haftorah is the selected portion of Scripture from the prophets that connects to the Torah reading. And Ezekiel chapter 1 is the Haftorah for Shavuot. And when you read that in parallel to what takes place in Acts chapter 2, it's phenomenal. Ezekiel speaks of these flames above people's heads and this wheel and the spirit and the movement and all these things. And this is what we see taking place. And then we see it in many ways revealed in Acts chapter 2 where the spirit comes down upon the congregation on Shavuot. The nations are represented there. The people that have have feared God, as Psalm 67 says, have come up to this pilgrimage festival. They're in the temple courtyards, and the Spirit falls upon them, indicating that God's Spirit is now being multiplied amongst the nations. It's not just for the Jewish people, but it's available to all nations, and all nations, as we see later on throughout the book of Acts, have equal access to that spirit and are equal before God as the Jewish people, as an extension of the people of Israel. Well, that's all for this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Thanks for joining us. Remember, you can follow us on social media and you can access our content through our CBN News and other CBN apps. And don't forget to sign up for our email blasts. Please keep praying for the protection of the nation of Israel. IDF soldiers, and for all those caught in harm's way, and for the peace of Jerusalem. I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.